So um, Anne Schilling will uh, keep her series on lectures on uh, diagram algebra, insertion algorithms, and <laughs> the last words. Uh, Platism. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you again um, for the invitation. So today I'm going to talk about some joint work with uh, Rosa Orellana, Franco Saliola, uh, Mike Zabrocki, and then partially also with Laura colman Um So th these are multiple papers and it will be slightly different from last time, but hopefully at the end we will sort of circle back to um, to the crystals. So what I want to talk about today is some, uh, I want to talk about some variants of RSK. Um, and so usually when we talk about RSK, um, you, you have some permutation or word or generalized permutation uh, consisting of integers and you insert it and you get a pair of tableau. So what I want to do today is sort of give you a, a variant of the RSK where you actually insert multisets instead of just integers. And we will see that this will give us some enumerative manifestation of what's called the double centralizer theorem. So if you have a representation V, and let's suppose that this um, decomposes into irreducibles, if you have two algebras acting on the space and they these actions commute with each other, um, then you can actually decompose this V as a product of a U lambda and a, v, a W lambda where the algebra A only acts on, on the U and the, and the algebra B only acts on the W. So we will see examples of this. Um, and uh, so once I describe this insertion algorithm, we will look at applications using what's called the partition algebra. So we will give, we will look at this insertion and we will see that we get um, Standard, a tuple of a standard tableau and what, what's called a multi, multi set value tableau. And one thing that is nice about this insertion is that it's actually well behaved with respect to subalgebras. So there are various uh, subalgebras of uh, the partition algebra, such as the Temple Leap algebra, the Brouwer algebra, and so on. And this insertion is well behaved with respect to that. And we will also see that this insertion gives us di the dimensions of the irreducibles as numbers of certain tableau. And then um, if time permits, I will also talk about some, sub some other subalgebra, which is called the uniform block permutation algebra. And that will give us um, some insight what's called plethism. And just as a preview, so what is plethism? This is just if you take um, two GLN representations and you so you compose them, um, then that uh, the decomposition of this composition uh, is also gives gives rise to the plethism. So I will describe that later. Okay, so let me start very easy by um, reviewing the RSK algorithm for you and. Uh, describing how this is related to representation theory. So RSK stands for Robinson, Chenstedt, Knuth. And um, there are basically three variants of this algorithm, one given by Robinson in 1938, one by Chenstedt in 1961, and one by Knuth in 1970. So Robin, what Robinson did is he took a permutation, so just a permutation of n numbers, and he gave a bijection of permutations to tuple of standard Young tableau of the same shape. So SYT here just stands for a standard Young tableau. Then uh, Schenstedt generalized this to words. So instead of every letter just appearing once, as is in a permutation, for a word, letters can repeat. So you, here you just take words of a given length in an alphabet K. And this bijection goes to now semi-standard Young tableau. So a semi-standard Young tableau is one where, again, letters can repeat. 
and they are weakly increasing in rows and strictly increasing in columns. And then the second tableau is still a standard young tableau. And then what Knuth did is he generalized this to generalized permutations. And in this case, both of the, the, the tableau will be semi-standard mm -hmm. tableau. So let me briefly remind you what a, a generalized permutation is. So in this case, you have two ordered alphabets, A and B. So you can think of A just the numbers from one up to N, B the numbers from one up to K. And then a generalized permutation is a two line array. So you have two lines such that the top line, so the letters A1 up to AL, they are from the alphabet A. The numbers from the bottom line, B1 up to BL are in the alphabet B. The top line should weakly increase. So the A's weakly increase. And uh, for the bottom line, so for the B's, whenever the A's are equal in the top line, the B's also have to weakly increase. So here's a, a simple example. Here, um, my um, alphabet for the A is the numbers from one up to six. The alphabet B is the numbers from one up to five. And here you can see the top line are numbers from one up to six and they are weakly increasing. My bottom line consists of numbers from one up to five. And then you can see that whenever the numbers in the top row are equal, so here I have one, 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 then the numbers in the bottom row are weakly, in, uh, are also weakly, sorry, but the numbers in the top row are equal, then the numbers in the bottom row are weakly increasing. But then if there's a jump here in the top row, there can be a jump, like the numbers can go down in the bottom row. So that's what's called a, a generalized permutation. And let me just briefly go over how this RSK algorithm works. So, Suppose that you have already a semi-standard Young tableau. So here I have drawn a semi-standard Young tableau for you, a pretty big one, and it's weakly increasing in rows, strictly increasing in columns. And now suppose that I'm I want to insert a letter two into this Young tableau. So I first need to explain to you what a row insertion is. Then what you do is you look at the smallest number that's bigger than the two. So in this case, this is this number three. Then the two will take the space, the, the spot of the three and it will bump it to the next row. And then you repeat the process. So now the three is wants to be inserted into the second row. You look for the smallest number that's bigger than three. So that's this four. The three will replace it. And then you insert the four. The four will replace the five the five will replace the seven. And then finally, the seven, there's no number that's um, bigger than the seven. So it will just sit at the end of the row. So these green numbers that I've indicated sort of give you the insertion path of this number two that we've inserted. And you can see that there's one extra um, box after the insertion. And this extra box will be used for the recording tableau. So the recording tableau will always sort of keep track where a letter ended up after you after you do the insertion. Any questions so far? So now um, the the RSK correspondence is the the most general one that uh, Knuth uh, defined is you start with a generalized permutation that I just defined, then you row insert the letters B one up to B L one by one. And then whenever, whenever you have this new box, you will record that new box with a letter in A in another tableau. Okay, so what Knuth um, gave was, was this bijection from generalized permutations to a pair of tableau, semi-standard tableau. The shape should be the same of the two tableau. And then P is a semi-standard tableau with entries in B because that's the in insertion tableau. And then Q keeps track of um, where, where the new boxes arose and 
Remember, those will be sort of recorded with the letters in A, so therefore Q is a semi-standard tableau with entries in A. The RSK correspondence, and so far, um, A and B are just any ordered alphabet, but usually people just uh, take this to be um, just numbers. Before I, I sort of give you the variant of this, I want to briefly show you that this combinatorial bijection um, actually has, uh, has um, a consequence in terms of enumerative results and also in terms of representation theory. So let's look at Schenstedt's variant where um, you take the words and you go to a pair of a semi-standard tableau and a standard tableau. Well, because it's a bijection, the number of words has to be equal to the number of these pairs of young tableau, right? So enumeratively, we have k to the n such words. And because this is a bijection, this therefore has to be equal to the sum of the product of the number of young tableau, a semi, the number of semi-standard young tableau times the number of standard young tableau. And then how is this related to representation theory? Well, if we take a representation V um, and we take the nth tensor product, then so let's suppose V is a GLK representation, then you can think of this as a GLK cross SN module um, where the SN action is you just permute tensor factors. And these two actions commute with each other. So this relates back to this uh, double centralizer theorem that I mentioned in the beginning. And therefore, V to the N decomposes into a direct sum of a WK and an S, a WK lambda and an S lambda, where the W <coughs> is a simple left uh, GLK module and the S lambda is a simple right SN module. Okay, so you, you get this decomposition because you have these two commuting actions. That's sort of like the, the, the relevance of, of the RSK algorithm. So it gives us enumerative results and it's also related to representation theory. So now I want to um, generalize this to diagram algebra. So what is a diagram algebra? So uh, I will give you examples in a second, but we can encode the diagram algebra, certain partition diagrams as generalized permutations. And instead of using integers, we are now going to use multisets. And I will give you the correspondence in a second. Then what we are going to do is we are going to put an order on these multisets. And then we can use the RSK algorithm and we will get pairs of a multi-set tableau. And as it turns out, the way that we are going to do that is well behaved with respect to taking subalgebra. So for example, going from the partition algebra to the temporally leap algebra. And it also matches the representation theory of Halverson and Jacobson. Um, and um, we can also give a new map from these standard multiset tableau to Bartelli, Bartelli diagrams, which is slightly different from um, that correspondence that Bankart and Halverson gave. And again, it's better uh, behaved with respect to taking um, subalgebras. Okay, so now let me go more into details about these partition diagrams. So we are now going to have two alphabets, an alphabet one up to K, and then also a BART alphabet, one bar up to K bar. And then what you do is you take a partition of the, the union of these two sets. So a partition is just, you take, you take that set and you partition it into blocks, okay? Into non-empty blocks. So here is an example. Here, my k is equal to eight. So I have the numbers from one up to eight and one bar up to eight bar. And I have now one, two, four, two bar, five bar in a block. 
three in a block, five, six, seven, three bar, four bar, six bar, seven bar in a block, and so on. And you can represent this in terms of a diagram where I write my unbarred letters in the top row and the barred letters in the bottom row. Okay, and then if numbers are in the same block, they will be um, connected in this diagram. And for me, it doesn't really matter how you connect them uh, for right now. It just matters that they are they are sort of connected uh, by lines, but the way that they are connected doesn't really matter. Okay, so here one, two, four, and then this five bar and two bar are all connected, and that indicates that they are in the same block, and the same for the other ones. Okay, and then the partition algebra itself is the span of of these diagrams or of these partitions. And you can actually multiply them by just sort of stacking them on top of each other and then um, tracing what the connected components are. But for me right now, I will go into that in more detail a little later, but for right now, um, the precise way of how you multiply is not that relevant. Um, but to explain the, the insertion, I need to tell you what a propagating block is. So a propagating block is one that contains vertices from both K and K bar. So it should have barred and unbarred letters both in the same block. So for example, this first one would be a propagating block because it contains barred and unbarred letters. And um, the other ones are called non-propagating blocks. So for example, the three and the one bar are non-propagating because they either only contain unbarred letters or only barred letters. Now, um, I'm going to tell you if you have such a diagram, how, how, do you, how can you construct a generalized permutation and then how can you insert that? So um, first of all, for the RSK algorithm, we need an order, right? We had to have ordered alphabets. So my order will be the last letter order. So whenever I have a block, I look at the largest letter in that block. And when I compare blocks, I just compare the largest letters. So if the largest letter of one block is smaller than the largest letter of another block, then that will also be the comparisons of the blocks, okay? So um, first, pies are called the propagating blocks. Um, and then I'm going to split the pies into pi pluses and pi minuses. The pi pluses consist of the um, unbarred letters in this propagating block, and pi minus will correspond to the barred letters in the propagating block. Then we also have the non-propagating blocks with unbarred letters and the non-propagating blocks in the barred letters. Then the way that this um, insertion algorithm works is you put you, you order the um, unbarred blocks um, in the propagating block, so these pi pluses, you order them in the, in the last letter order. You put them in the top row of our generalized permutation, and then you put the corresponding pi minuses in the bottom row of the, of the generalized permutation. So now we have an order on that, so we can just apply the usual RSK and we get two tableau, right? So the P tableau will correspond to bar, like multisets with barred letters and the Q tableau will have um, the unbarred letters. And um, then you still have the, the, the numbers in the non-propagating blocks. And um, so the, the partition algebra has a parameter P, uh, P uh, sorry, K and also N. So this N is usually much larger than the K. So um, here, what we do is we just add a row to the bottom of our um, tableau such that the total number of, of um, elements or uh, boxes in, in the partition is N. 
And then uh, to the P, we append the the elements and the the non the non propagating blocks in the K bar. And to the Q, we are going to adjoin the ones uh, where the with the non propagating blocks in the alphabet K. So here here's an example. Okay, so here's now my partition algebra P nine. 18, so n is 18. Um, my propagating blocks are these ones. So we have uh, four propagating blocks. I split them into the, uh, the unbarred and barred letters, and I order them in the last letter order. So here, this would be my smallest block, my second smallest block, my third smallest block, my last block, right, because four is smaller than five, is smaller than six, is smaller than nine. Then in the bottom row, I write the corresponding Bart letters. And then we just do the usual RSK and with this last letter order. So we get two tableau if we do this insertion. But you can see that now um, the, the entries can be uh, multi-sets, right? Not just integers, but they are actually multi-sets. And then, well, to, to actually um, also take the non-propagating blocks into account, we add um, more, more boxes to our tableau such that in total we will have 18 um, boxes. And then to the P, we add the, the barred letters and to the um, Q, we add the, the unbarred letters. So this would be the result of our, of our insertion. So what we, what we get from this is now sort of an analog of, of the RSK result, namely what we showed is that we have a bijection between the set partitions of this uh, tuple of, of alphabets, K and K bar, to a union of um, tableau. And now they are, these are um, standard multi-set tableau over an alphabet K. And they, again, they have to have the same shape, lambda. Okay, and as before, remember we, we got an enumerative result from such a bijection. So the number of set partitions is um, the Bell number. And so therefore we get that um, the Bell number is also equal to the sum of the square of these sizes of the of the set of standard multi-set tableau that immediately comes out of showing that this is a bijection. So I promise to you that um, that there that this insertion is well behaved with respect with respect to taking uh, subalgebras, and so there are lots of ways of how you can take subalgebras. So in particular, you can take subclasses of the set partitions. And here I have listed a lot of them, like a lot of the uh, ones that appear in the literature. So for example, permutations are just the ones where every element in the top is connected to exactly one in the bottom, right? You can view that as a permutation. You can also look at perfect matchings where every element has a partner, but it doesn't necessarily have to a top element doesn't necessarily have to be partnered with a with a bottom element, and so on and so on. I don't actually want to go um, through all of these uh, in detail, but these are sort of all the ones that appear in the literature. And associated to these um, particular uh, diagrams, you have. Uh, an associated algebra. So for example, if you look at planar perfect matchings, this will correspond to the, the temporally Lee algebra. And the, the, the dimensions of these algebras are also known. And so one thing that you can check is that under this bijection phi that I described, so where you, uh, you take a generalized permutation, as I described before, you then do RSK um, and you get these, uh, these standard multi-set tableau. 
you can actually describe the properties of planar and matching and so on under this bi bijection psi. And the details of the slide don't really matter so much. What matters is that these properties go, like you can describe these properties directly in terms of these uh, standard multiset tableau. So um, you can describe them explicitly. Okay, so you can say what is a matching tableau, what is a planar tableau, and so on. And um, therefore, under this bijection psi, um, the 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 tableau can be fully characterized. So for every such subalgebra, you can say exactly what the properties are of of the corresponding standard multiset tableau. And therefore, um, as a corollary, you get that for if you have such a, a subalgebra AK and you want to look at the irreducible corresponding um, to the subalgebra AK indexed by um, a partition lambda. And I should say lambda bar just means you take lambda and you remove the first row. So remember in our construction, right? We first did RSK, but then we added this, this long row. Um, so the, the lambda bar just means you, you basically remove this bottom row. You, the dimensions of these irreducibles are precisely the number of elements in these sets of tableau corresponding to the to the subalgebra. So with these properties that I've just described. Um, any questions so far? And then another corollary is um, that the, the dimension of the algebra itself is again, the sum of the square of the number of, of tableau. Okay, so again, this is sort of a complete analogy to uh, what you do for the RSK algorithm. So the next thing that I want to talk about is, um, I want to talk a little bit more about- Sorry, Am. Yes. May I have a small question. Yes. In those diagram algebras, usually you have parameters to remove loop when you multiply objects. Yes. Uh huh. In in your diagram algebra, is this parameter one or is it just any values? Um. Yeah. So for me, since currently, I I only sort of care about uh, the dimensions. It doesn't really matter what the parameters are. So I haven't really described to you how you multiply them. So yeah, you, you can think of the parameter just being one, for example. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so, so far, yeah, the parameter didn't really come into play. Uh, any other question? So what I want to do next is look at, um, look at this double centralized algebra again, uh, the, this double centralizer theorem again. Um, Namely, um, so if you have a GLN uh, representation V and you take the case tensor product, we saw under the usual RSK that this commutes with the SK action, right? But one thing that you can now do is you can view this GLN representation and you can restrict it to SN because SN is a subalgebra of GLN, right? So uh, then you would just have the usual diagonal action of uh, GLN on V, but yeah, now you just restrict it to SN. And then the question is, what actually commutes with this action? And the answer is precisely this partition algebra that we that we just uh, looked at, this PK of N and uh, this was uh, studied by Martin and Jones in the 1990s. Um, and as we've seen, so uh, a basis for this is the set of partitions. But if we view it this way, um, we now sort of have two centralizer pairs that we can look at. We can look at um, this commuting action of GLN and SK on V to the K. But we can also look at the action of PK of this partition algebra and SN. And 
these actually also form a centralizer pair. And um, let, let us look at this in, in a little bit more detail. And yeah, here, here's just a picture of, of Martin and Jones. And so if we uh, look at this pair of, um, of subalgebras, these centralizer algebras, if you, for example, study the book by Goodman and Wallach, then um, they, they say, or they have theorems about the situation, namely, so the situation that we have is we have an algebra A, which is embedded into an algebra B. And one thing that you can then look at is at the restriction of an irreducible for the algebra B, restricting it to the algebra A. And if you do that, you um, the, the irreducibles of the algebra A might appear with certain multiplicity. So these are also called restriction coefficients. But then suppose you have um, another embedding, like an algebra C embedded in, into an algebra D. And now suppose that on these diagonals, these form centralizer pairs. So B and C form a centralizer pair and A and D form a centralizer pair. Then, um, it, uh, for example, in the, in the book by Goodman and Wallach, it's shown that the indices of the simple modules for B and C are the same, and the indices of the simple modules for A and D are the same. So in particular, if you have such a seesaw pair, you will also know, so if you know sort of this decomposition, you will also know how to restrict an irreducible of the algebra D to um, the algebra C, because these coefficients here will turn out to be the same. And the indices of the modules are also the same. So let me now rephrase that into the setting that we were looking at, right? So we were looking at um, a GLN representation V. We took the case tensor power. Um, then we have this embedding of SN into a GLN, but we also have the embedding of SK into PK. And um, then we have that GLN and SK form a centralizer pair and um, PK and SN also form a centralizer pair. So we are exactly in this setting of the seesaw pair um, that I described before. So in particular, um, the, if you want to know what is the restriction of a GLN module to an SN, SN module, alternatively, you could study, oh, what is the restriction of a PK module in terms of an SK module? And these restriction coefficients turn out to be the same. The restriction of GLN to SN is actually quite hard. Um, so therefore, looking at this side, um, you can also think about like, how could you sort of look at, at, at this? And uh, one thing that we observed is that you can actually go through another subalgebra. What we want to do is we want to sort of restrict from the, the partition algebra to SK. But there's actually another algebra in between, which we call the uniform block permutation algebra. And it turns out that if you want to look at these restrictions of PK to UK, um, the, the restriction coefficients are some generalized little bit Richardson coefficients. And then the, the restriction of UK to SK are special cases of the plethysm that I mentioned before. And um, yeah, I will go into more detail what, what the plethysm means at the, at the end of the talk. But these are kind of like hard questions. But the, the setup in terms of representation theory sort of gives you a tool to study these, these hard um, questions and combinatorics and representation theory. Um, and 
that's why uh, I briefly want to sort of go through that with you. So in the, in the next couple of slides, uh, I'm going to um, tell you how you can actually get a combinatorial model for the representation theory of this uniform block permutation algebra, which sits in between PK and SK. So let's do that. And by the way, um, in, in some of the literature, people also call this uniform block permutation algebra a party algebra, or the party algebra is actually a little bit more, more general. Um, but uh, Tanabi and Kosuda called this the party algebra because uh, think about two parties, right? Um, and parties want to have committees where they, they decide certain things. In each committee, you would like to have the same number of members from each party, right? So on the subcommittee for, let's say, traffic, you would like to have 10 people from party A and 10 people from party B and not some, some imbalance. So this is exactly how we are now going to define our uniform block permutations. So as in the, in the partition algebra, we are looking at set partitions of the, the alphabet K up to K bar, but now we want that they are the same number of barred letters as they are numbers of uh, unbarred letters. So for each block DI, if you intersect with the unbarred letters, the size of that set should be the same as the size of the, the, the barred letters, okay? So we are now going to restrict to this case where the partitions are, are just of this form. And that's why we, we call this call this uniform because the, the block sizes are, are uniform. So here's an example. Um, again, we have a partition of uh, the number, the numbers from one up to nine in this case and one bar to nine bar. But now you can see that every block has the same number of barred and unbarred letters, right? Here we have one barred and one unbarred letters. Here we have two uh, barred and two unbarred letters. And here we have three um, barred and unbarred letters. Okay, and um, why do we call them uniform block permutations? Well, because you can think of them uh, as a size preserving, a size preserving bijections, right? So a particular um, a particular block we can again split into the barred and unbarred letters, and um, we would put the unbarred letters on the top, the barred letters at the bottom. And, and sorry, so now for the barred letters, I, I dropped the bar because they're in the bottom row, right? But the two four would correspond to the, this two four in our generalized permutation. Um, and then you can see that so. A particular block of a given size will be mapped to a block of the same size, right? Two and four have the same size, five, seven have the same size, and then one, three, and one, two, again, they have the same size. So that's why the elements of UK are also called uniform block permutations. And as before, we can look at, at the diagrams for these set partitions, right? We just connect all the ones that, that are in the same block. And now I'm actually going to tell you how to multiply, but again, I'm not going to um, uh, think about any parameters. I'm just going to stack um, the, the two diagrams on top of each other. And then um, at the end of the day, we are just going to look at connected components of this, right? So. Here, the, the green dots are the green dots up here. Then I multiply the D with the D prime. I'm just going to stack the two diagrams on top of each other. And then the connected components at the end of the day will look like this. But for, for this talk, I, I don't need any um, extra parameter. So to look at the representation theory for this um, algebra, it's important to know what the idempotents are. So the idempotents are just elements that square to its 
to themselves, right? So E squared is equal to E. And it turns out um, that the idempotents are precisely the ones where if I take a certain partition of the top elements, then they should be mapped exactly to the same partitions in the bottom. So here, for example, um, I have one and four together in a partition for um, a, an idempotent one and four should be mapped to one bar, four bar, right? Because then if I stack them on top of each other, I get the same thing back. So it turns out that um, idempotents are actually indexed by set partitions of just the, the single alphabet K, not of the alphabet K union K bar. Whatever I partition my top in, the bottom will be partitioned by the same thing and um, they will be mapped to to exactly the, the, the same um, partition to the same block uh, under this item potent. And it turns out that these actually form a complete set of item potents in, in our uniform block permutation. So to study the, the representations, what, what is important are what are called the maximal subgroups of our algebra. And or actually in our case, I can think of it as a monoid. Um, and it turns out that these maximal subgroups are indexed by idempotents. And in this particular example, the subgroups are precisely those where the top and the bottom um, form the same uh, set partition. So here's an example. Um, so here, I'm, I have now a set partition, again, of the numbers just from one up to six, no Bart letters, right? So <clears throat> just of the numbers from one up to K. So uh, one and two are in separate blocks, three, four are in a block, and five, six are in a block. And then um, the subgroup just permutes um, elements of the same size of the blocks. So I can commute the one and the two, right? So here I map one to one, two to two, but here in these last two, I'm interchanging one and two. And then you can do the same for the, the, the blocks of size two, you can interchange um, the blocks of size two. So either they are mapped to themselves or they are, they're interchanged. And um, it turns out in general, if you have a, a set partition of the set from one up to k, then um, the, the, the maximal subgroups of, of the uniform block permutation algebra are actually um, tensor products of just symmetric groups. And there's a whole theory of the representation theory of monoids. So a very good reference for this is a book by Steinberg. And if you, if you study this book, you will learn that um, if you know what the maximal subgroups are, then you also know what the indexing set is for your simple modules. Namely, the indexing set will just be the tuple of indexing sets for your maximal subgroup. So here we had a tensor product of just symmetric groups and therefore, and so symmetric, the representations of the symmetric groups are indexed by partitions. If we have K, um, so here we have like a, a, tu a tuple of or a product of K uh, symmetric groups. So therefore the indexing set of our uh, uniform block permutation monoid is just um, a tuple of partitions. Okay, and then if you study this and you study the, the characters of this, um, one thing that, okay, so here's just an example of, of the indexing set. Um, one thing that we proved was going back to the, the question of the restriction, right? If you have a particular module, how do you restrict it to a subalgebra. So if you study this representation theory, um, we, we showed that the multiplicity of an SK module 
in the restriction of the uniform block permutation um, uh, algebra restricted to SK is given by this Hall inner product of these sure functions. So S lambda is just a sure function. And when I write S lambda of something, this is what's known as the classism. So in a, in a moment, I will tell you precisely what that means. And so what you, what you can see here is that the representation theory or the restriction of the representation theory of the uniform block permutation um, algebra is related to certain um, plethysm coefficients. And now let me briefly tell you about well, what these plethysms actually are. So suppose that you have a GLN representation Oh, sorry, you, you just have GLN, which is all the invertible n by n matrices. Suppose that you have a, rep, a GLN representation. So you can think of that as a map from GLN to GLM. Then suppose that you also have a GLM representation, which you can think of as a homomorphism from GLM to GLR. If you have that, you can compose the two. Right, so you can compose the two representations. And that is what's called, so if you look at the characters of these representations, that's also what's known as the plethysm. How do we translate that back to symmetric functions or the sure functions? But that, that uses what's called the Frobenius map. So if you have the, the class functions of GLN, so this just means functions that are constant on conjugacy classes. And if lambda n is a ring of symmetric functions of degree n, then, well, on lambda n, we have, for example, the power sum symmetric functions. PR is just the sum of the rth power of, of the variables. P lambda is a product of a P of just, of just an integer. Then we have another basis of the ring of symmetric functions, which are the S lambda, which uh, we've seen in multiple talks are just sums over semi-standard Young tableau. Then um, the Frobenius characteristic map maps class functions to symmetric functions by mapping a character um, to the sum in terms of the power sum symmetric function. And it turns out that there's an identity, namely the sure functions can be written precisely in terms of the irreducible characters of the symmetric group in this way. So therefore, under this Frobenius characteristic map, the irreducible character chi lambda of the symmetric group gets mapped to a sure function. Okay, so. Therefore, this uh, problem of composing um, representations of GLN uh, can be translated to symmetric functions. And in terms of symmetric functions, this composition would mean you take the, you take the plethysm of um, two sure functions. And um, one of the big combinatorial open problems is what are the coefficients of such a plethysm as lambda as mu if you if you decompose that again into in terms of sure functions so what are these coefficients and so this representation theory that i just described to you of the uniform block permutation algebra well if we if we go back right so this formula here gave an interpretation for a product of these um, a product of these plethysms uh, as some multiplicity of a, of a given representation. Um, but one thing that one would really like to know is more, more precisely is what is a, what what is a combinatorial formula for for these coefficients, not just a representation theoretic um, interpretation. And this sort of now goes back to my first two lectures, right? In the in this 
uh, second lecture, I said that, well, if you have, uh, so I think it was in the first lecture, sorry, in the first lecture, I said, so if you have a symmetric function and you know that it decomposes positively into a sure function, you can, you can try to impose a crystal structure on the underlying set and then get a, a combinatorial interpretation for, for the decomposition. And well, so this would be exactly sort of the setting here. So one of the problems uh, which we are still working on it, but which actually seems quite hard is to find a crystal on tableau of tableau or multi-set tableau, which actually explains these uh, plethysm coefficients. And yeah, thank you very much. Um, just as a takeaway, plethysm is actually a hard problem, but you can use some representation theory to, to get some explanations. Um, and the other sort of takeaway I hope from my talks will be that combinatorics, representation theory, and integrable systems, they all play together. And as we've seen from many of these nice lectures presented in these three weeks, um, you can learn a lot from one of these to get insights into another one of these um, problems. And here, here's, uh, yeah, here are some pictures of my collaborators. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much for the talk and the series of lectures. So are there any questions uh, in the audience? I have a small a question about the interaction between the sub-algebra you presented. So we saw mm -hmm. in, in this lecture that you have, if they are in certain sort of dual pairs and uh, they, there's the seesaw uh, property, then you can extract some useful information. Mm -hmm. Do you need to be in such a correspondence or could you have correspondence between any subalgebra of this uh, of the partition algebra together using your insertion algorithm oh yeah so i think you are asking um could i could i do a seesaw pair with one of the subalgebras and then look at the other side i guess that's what you're asking right yeah yeah and th yeah this is a actually a, yeah a very good suggestion and this is not something we have looked at yet but um, yeah, you could also look at, at other subalgebras and then see whether you can gain any information. Mm -hmm. okay. But I, I don't yet know the answer to that. So actually, I had a small question, but maybe uh, maybe you mentioned it and I missed it, so I'm sorry if that's the case. But when you multiply this, the, the diagrams, the D and D, D, D prime, mm -hmm. uh, so whenever you create a loop, in the like stack diagram, you just remove it with weight one, right? Yeah. So in and yeah, for the, for this case that I described, yeah, loops you would just um, you would just remove with weight one. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and would it be like would it make sense or would it be possible to actually add a weight to this loop and kind of keep track of it? that? That's something we do in the temporary lib algebra and integrable mm -hmm. system. Oh, in that context, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I guess you could do that. Mm -hmm. In principle, yes, you could do that, but um, <coughs> we didn't actually do that in, in our analysis. But yeah, in principle, you can, you okay. could, you could add that in the same way that you would do that for the partition algebra. So uh, thanks, Anne again. <laughs>